Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Hanson Searcher's three-part series in building powerful teams. My name is Alice Waitman. I'm the CEO of Hanson Search, which is a global headhunting business specializing in communications, marketing, and commercial roles. We recruit globally for our clients from our offices in the UK, France, and the UAE. And delighted today to be uh, running this event in conjunction with Formative Communications, a management communication training company for the public, private and government sectors. It's been a tough 18 months for many businesses and individuals. So we really felt this was an opportunity to come together, reboot and reskill on leadership uh, development and building powerful teams for now and the future, especially as we're going through this rather difficult transition of hybrid working. Um, so we decided to make it actually a three part series to give people an opportunity to learn more and ask questions throughout this series and incorporate some of the principles from Michael Bush, who's the CEO of A Great Place to Work. And uh, Helen's gonna come on and tell us a little bit more about that later. But I'm delighted to be joined this morning by Effie, Helen and Andrew, who are gonna talk a little bit about their backgrounds initially, introduce themselves, um, and then we'll get into the, the key topics. Just for a little bit of housekeeping, please do use the functionality to ask any questions. And um, I will be opening up to the audience to ask lots of questions. It's a real opportunity to hear from practical experience as well as um, very informative and experienced coaches. So um, Effie is the uh, director of PR and communications for Hearst UK. I'm sure many people have heard of the titles that are underneath Hearst. Um, Elle Magazine, Good Housekeeping, Cosmopolitan, and many, many more. And um, Helen and Andrew are both part of Informative Comms. So, um, Effie, do you want to introduce yourself first of all? Yeah, thank you, and thanks for having me. Um, so, as you mentioned, I'm the Director of PR and Comms. We've got 22 amazing brands, um, and I've been there for about three years, but um, I actually kind of fell into PR because I started off as a journalist at the BBC. Um, so I'm not sure that I actually ever thought that I would be working in comms. I always thought I would, you know, stay as a journalist, um, but actually um, it's actually worked out really well because I think the transferable skills from being a journalist have really helped me throughout my career. Um, and uh, in terms of kind of the, the types of things that um, I've done, I pretty much have worked across sort of every sector and agency that you can think of. So FMCG, beauty, tech, et cetera. Um, some amazing sort of agencies and global accounts. Um, and then I really went in-house for the first time when I was communications director at Bauer Media. Um, and Bauer Media has a radio division and a magazines division. So I headed up the radio side. So Absolute Radio, Kiss, Magic, you know, some firm favorites there, which was brilliant. And then I moved into the magazine arm of the business. Um, and I think at the time we probably had over sort of 100 mainstream and sort of specialist titles. So everything from Grazia to Empire to Heat. So a whole host of sort of magazines within the portfolio. Um, and then that leads me through to where I am today. So as a team, we're quite a small compact team. Um, we look after all of the corporate um, functions within our business internal comms, which I'll probably touch on um, as we speak, which we've definitely um, put a huge focus on during the pandemic. Um, we obviously do lots of events, the likes of Harper's Bazaar and L and Esquire. So uh, looking after that. And then obviously our sort of bread and butter is the sort of staple consumer comms that we do across all of our brands. And actually, I would say in the past year, there's probably been a lot more uh, focus just due to the nature of the pandemic and everything that's happened on crisis comms. Great, thank you very much for that. Andrew, can I go to you next? Yes, thank you very much. And thanks, Alice, for inviting us for this, to take part in this series. I'm uh, Andrew, I'm originally from Oxford, um, but I've 
I've, I've um, worked my entire career outside the UK. I worked for a number of years for the British Council, which is the UK's cultural relations uh, agency. And I was uh, posted in um, uh, Southeast Asia for a number of years, Central Europe. And I've been here in Brussels. I'm, I'm talking to you from Brussels, where we're an hour ahead. And it's sunny, by the way. Um, we've been, um, and I've, I've been based in Brussels for 15 years. And um, I turned my experience of working within the with, within a UK agency into training because I've got a background in teaching and training. Um, and also my, my academic experience, which is in public relations and communications. So I run uh, and conceived of formative communications. And we, we train people from a lot of, from a whole range of different types of organizations, whether they're corporate, um, like Google, um, governments, we've worked with the US State Department and the UK government, as well as um, institutional, a lot of the institutional bodies here. And it's really fascinating um, for me to go into lots of different types of organisations, both absolutely huge and small, um, and to see how they organise their staff and their communications, not just on the internal communications that sort of go through the internet, but also how managers and leaders are here to communicate one-to-one -one with staff when it, in things like performance reviews. So it's really fascinating to see how people function always always an interesting day when I'm going to a different uh, place and of course this has been a really extraordinary period of 18 months um, and we've seen a lot of uh, organizations really stepping up to the plate and reaching out to, to staff who are struggling at home for various reasons um, and you know throughout this conversation I'd, I'd like to reflect on some of the things that I think may be coming up or some of the things I hear from my clients so that's me I'm back over to you Alice Great, thank you. And Helen, do you want to introduce yourself, but also tell us a little bit about this um, concept of um, uh, that's come from Michael Bush um, on great places to work? Sure, sure. Uh, so yeah, so I'm Helen and I am a business performance coach and trainer. And I do management and leadership training with Andrew in his company, Formative. And separate to that, I coach individuals on their professional um, performance and development. And I became a coach after 25 years of working as a marketing and communications consultant. Uh, I didn't mean to become a coach. I actually went on a coaching course to have better conversations with my clients and with colleagues. And I'd like to say I fell in love with, but I didn't. I actually was blown away how difficult I found coaching. Because up until that point, as a as a consultant and as a manager of other people, I had been rewarded for knowing what to do, having an opinion and telling other people what to do. And coaching is a complete opposite of that. So it was a real muscle that I, I suddenly realized I, I did not have. And what I found was there was a real beauty in when you do, if I may say, shut up and start listening to what other people have to say, you actually create an, a tr an environment of trust and you actually start hearing what people are saying, which they might find difficult to say. And uh, it was really beautiful to see people show up fully. And the idea of coaching is that you encourage people to think differently and more creatively about their own problems rather than telling them what to do. Um, I am British. I'm also now Belgian. I live also in Belgium. Um, I've been here 21 years. And prior to that, I was living and working in London and also in Edinburgh. So let me tell you a bit about why on earth are we focusing on, for example, fairness this time. So there's many ways that we can slice this looking at management. And what I loved about this video, so I, we put a video on the LinkedIn um, event page. If you didn't see it, I can put it into the link afterwards, into the chat afterwards. So Great Places to Work is a research and analytics company. And every year they produce um, a Fortune 100 great, place, great places, great companies to work for list. And so in that process, they are interviewing hundreds and thousands of people from cooks to cleaners up to the CEO. And every year in order to produce this report. And the CEO, which you mentioned, his name is Michael C. Bush. He produced a TED talk a few years ago, very short, three minutes. And in a nutshell, he says his data proves that happy employees significantly improve your bottom line and also halve staff turnover, which, so something very fluffy, 
actually has a very concrete impact on business. And he boils happiness down to three things that everybody wants at work. And so that is trust and respect, fairness, and to be heard. So today we're going to be talking about fairness, but I think it's impossible not we will implicitly uh, implicitly be referring to trust and respect and also to be heard, I think, as Effie talks about her experiences and Andrew as he talks about his. So, you know, but that that's the reason why we're, we're using it. I think it's a really nice thing that er that's what everybody wants. And when I mention it in trainings, everybody's writing it down because it is so simple. And actually, yes, it is, and it is probably something that we have not experienced um, in, in a work environment. So um, yeah, so that's what we, that's why we're using that format today. Great, thank you, Helen. Um, that's really useful for everyone. So let's get into the, the, the topic of um, building powerful teams. And obviously it's been, you know, unpre unprecedented set of challenges for businesses to navigate through. And a lot of discussion we're having with clients um, and that you read in the newspapers around this new hybrid working environment. Effie, what do you think are the key ingredients for building powerful teams in this post-COVID hybrid working world? Yeah, I, I mean, when, when we say post-COVID, I actually think we're kind of still working our way through it. And I, you know, I kind of think everything that we've seen in the past 18 months kind of still applies. Like, I don't think we're still out of it so I know for us as a business I think some of the practices that we had to adopt and put in place will continue sort of throughout and it's just really about I guess a new way of, of working but um, for me as a leader I think um, some of the things that I've learned are really important for my team and for you know our business at Hearst is um, things like putting people first. Um, you know, everyone that works within a business, whether it's agency side or in-house, you know, they're really the driving force. So it's, it's taking care of them, it's keeping them motivated to ensure productivity. Um, and that's really important. I think because of the way that things have obviously gone, I think uh, managers and leaders have had to learn about being flexible and having that degree of flexibility uh, within your teams. Everyone has different situations. We have parents, people who are living alone, um, people who are caring for elderly parents, people who got sick during the pandemic um, and I just think that in terms of sort of keeping your team together and, and, and supported you need to sort of recognize that there has to be a, a degree of flexibility around that and I think that's something definitely at Hearst that has really been front and center and, and has ensured that we were able to continue in really sort of quite strange circumstances. Um, the other thing I think is really important is playing to people's strengths um, and making sure that you bring out the best in your teams. The, the beauty of a team and I think the beauty of you know, a team like mine is that we all have different strengths and we also have weaknesses. Um, and I think it's really making sure that you play to those strengths, but also ensuring that you offer training and support for maybe those areas that do need to, to be developed. Um, and, and one thing that really impacted my team was crisis comms. I, I pretty much my previous roles um, had dealt with a lot of crisis comms. Uh, I wouldn't say I enjoy it, but it, it was definitely something I had a lot of experience in. But I think for my team, a lot of them really hadn't experienced such a high wave and a sort of constant having to deal with one thing after the other. Um, and so the training and support, particularly within this area, I think has um, had sort of the, the biggest impact on my team and it's been a sort of steep learning curve but it's also really progressed the development of my team um, and then um, 
I think there's there's a point around keeping teams motivated because normally we'd be in the office sitting next to each other exchanging creative ideas I mean if you think about Hearst as a business we're creatives at the end of the day and it's all about being able to communicate with our editorial teams and all of the different teams across the business and when you're separated that's so much harder to do so how do you stimulate that creativity and sort of keep your teams um, motivated and I think you know one of the things um, that I like to do is almost demonstrate the value of you know of what we're doing and how it impacts our business so always reminding um, ourselves of actually the importance of comms which I think you know during the past 18 months has really come to a forefront and if you look at a lot of businesses that's probably one of the areas that they really have you know started to invest more in and take seriously so right up at the top level you have CEOs leaning heavily on their comms teams to kind of help them um navigate through this and then the final thing and I, I always say this is diversity just because you need a diverse range of opinions to have a successful and um, a productive workforce. Great thank you Effie and, and we've sort of delved into quite a few key topics that I'd like to explore further as, as we go through. Um, Andrew or Helen, would you like to pick it up on anything that you've seen from a coaching perspective or you've heard your clients talk about in, to, in relation to, to what Effie, Effie said? Well, I think Effie's, you know, she's, she's doing a fantastic job um, because the things that I hear is, you know, the, the pain points and the frustrations that people have. Um, so, you know, the... And so what I'm hearing, you know, she's people first. I mean, fantastic. That's that's for some reason I don't we seem to sort of struggle with getting work done because we keep forgetting we're actually working with people. And so the, the sooner you admit and, and embrace the fact that we have people and we're different and that we have different needs, we have different common sense, different cultures. And we come from different angles and, and Effie for what I'm hearing is that she's absolutely harnessing that those differences to create um to, to have that creativity so that's the I mean I that my comment on just that would be yeah I mean she's she's ticking the boxes and that sense of flexibility I think Andrew and I can absolutely identify with some of our clients who um really got freaked out by the fact that people were not, were not in the office and everything was on a hold just until we get back in the office mm -hmm. And it's just not happening and they're like okay well we'll do some training then online you know just temporarily to kind of muddle through and what i hear is effie she absolutely embraced the, the the situation as it was and started to adapt and you know and i i, I couldn't agree more with the fact of playing to people's strengths i've as a, as a manager of other people and and, and watching other people manage it, it, there's just you see people just being destroyed as they are criticized for not delivering on their job and yet they're probably right or wrongly they're in the wrong job or, or their skills aren't being used and it's heartbreaking it's just heartbreaking to watch it and as a British person it doesn't mean much in this country in Belgium but you know horses for courses or you know it's it's it really is obvious and you can see people go on and they leave the organization and they go do brilliant stuff somewhere else so I, I think embracing the fact is everybody has strengths and if they're not delivering on what you want then it's it's perhaps to be curious about what they are good at so that's um that's from my point of view Andrew I don't know if you've got anything to add to that yeah my um slightly different angle but I think after you mentioned you get to the point where training development is an important element in this and I we're training company so we're like a, a weather vane we respond to what people and what companies are wanting um, we don't go to to companies with a menu and say right you've got to do this they come to us and tell us uh, we need to do this can you help turn um, our sort of strategic um, thinking into behaviors and skills that managers and staff can use and if, if we take an example for 
um, on, on training and development, if we take something like performance management review, where it's traditional that a lot of companies, a lot of organisations will have a procedure in place and a set of standards which everybody has to abide by in order to make the conversation, the review, a positive experience and agreed and written down. Large part of that, I think, is quite um, um, about compliance. It's about, look, we've done our six monthly review, we've written the notes, we've signed it, we've agreed it, it's on file things. Now, I'm just thinking, and I get, you know, early signs with talking to clients that as part of that, um, should companies start be start putting, start to be putting the welfare into that and, uh, and saying, well, look, as part of your role as a manager of a team and individuals, um, we need to check in with people a bit. And we may be going beyond COVID and the immediate crisis that was happening over the, the different waves that happened last year. But is welfare, and it's almost like, it's a question actually, I'll sort of put back to people. Do you think this aspect of welfare, checking in on people to ensure that they're motivated and happy because they'll perform better, is something that the companies should be including more and asking leaders to do more of, instead of just focusing on performance, on your business performance. And my indications, initial conversations is, yes, there's, it's, it's an emerging as it's, it's gone up the list of things, welfare. And I, that's why I'm optimistic. I think that's a good thing. Yeah. It's interesting you say that, Andrew. We recently conducted a study and had yeah. over 1,100 respondents and 70% of employers were putting employee welfare and well-being ahead of commercial and revenue decisions yeah. um, in their decision making of, of coming yeah. back to work and things like that. So I, I think absolutely it is happening and um, I can include the link at the end to the report, but um, mm. it, it, it's, it's very interesting. So just moving on, actually, um, Effie, you talked a bit about um, uh, communication and leadership communication styles have evolved um, and the importance actually of communications in that. Um, how have you seen these changing and evolving and, and, and what best practices and comms is, is going to stay from a leadership perspective? Yeah, um, so, um, and actually touching on Andrew's point, um, for, for us at Hearst, the focus on internal comms, like pretty much, I mean, if I think about how we were pre-pandemic, we maybe sent out two, two notes a month from our CEO to communicate to um, the people within the business. And then right at the start of the pandemic, the, we were flooded with questions and, and, and no one had been in this situation before. And we really had to invest in communicating with people more often. So actually, we started sending out information every single day. And within that, it was everything from what the latest news updates were. So what had the government said? How did it impact our people? It was stuff to do with sort of operations, like how do you operate from working from home? What's the technology available, et cetera? Um, giving insight into sort of the different business areas around um, within our business and, and, you know, the work that they were doing and even some of the challenges that they were facing, but then also celebrating and um, helping, helping like using the resources, like people were sort of stuck indoors. We've got amazing health titles like men's health, women's health, runner's world. Everyone started getting more into fitness. And so we would, offer content within these like very important business updates that also helped people's lifestyle. And I think Andrew mentioned mental health, definitely for us at Hearst. And I think the thing that we've probably done really well is taking this into consideration and ensuring that we have the right measures and support in place. We've got a group of people called the Mental Health Ambassadors that have been there sort of throughout. We had them pre-pandemic. They definitely became a vital sort of resource as we were navigating through it. But then we also um, introduced other sort of measures like an employee assistance program so that people could speak to external support if they were struggling. And I, I think if you speak to a lot of leaders and a lot of businesses, I think 
mental health and the challenges of mental health within teams is probably the most difficult thing that we've had to navigate because it has impacted people like this has been really real for us and so it's just making sure that as a business we wanted to make sure that we supported people as best we could and that we had those resources there if people um were struggling um i think as leaders we've had to take more a sort of accountability um you know listen to your teams some things you might try out that maybe don't work and i think it's really important always to listen to your teams and their needs and work out like what is important and what is necessary and what you can do to support your teams to kind of bring out um the best and then i think the final thing is is that we're all humans and um what's been really lovely is that i think it's brought definitely my team a lot closer together and i think a good manager is a manager with empathy like you you know you really have to be able to sort of empathize with the different situations that people have been in um and just you know not only see them as an employee but see them as a sort of human being and a, as a colleague and I, i think just want to help and support them as as best you can and i think it goes both ways as well because sometimes the onus is always put on the leaders but if you're if you're working with your teams if you're supporting them when things are tough for you it kind of goes both ways so um i i think for us as a business those have kind of like been the key things and celebration i think that's the final point it hasn't been all do doom and gloom like we've had some amazing successes um you know my team we won two awards last year for in house team of the year and that that really uplifted us um and it kind of gave us a sense of purpose so i think it's really important to sort of celebrate the small and the big wins as well thank thank you afi um i mean just just sort of jumping onto that uh, the pain points there um helen and uh afi talked a bit about you know people having to be human to listen have you heard those sort of pain points coming out from from clients during your coaching sessions so what the the pain points that i've heard and i'll be absolutely honest with you they were there before covid and they've just got worse because they were muddling along before and they were in the office so they could perhaps catch something so i'm not going to say anything new the, the the there's four ones i mean there's many but i'm there's four and i'll i'll go through each one and if it's too much then i'll i'll just stop so The first one is this sense of frustration from the manager that the team aren't delivering what he or she asked. Uh that's always been there and so but it's got worse because we're not seeing them in person we're having to do it through email or um online. And so there's this sense of disappointment and and that, that tension grows. So if we look at it from a sense of fairness I think if you are having that question oh I've got one particular employee or my team it's very inconsistent in how they deliver I think the first thing you need to ask yourself is um what did did I really communicate was I explicit with what I wanted have I am I making assumptions about well it's kind of obvious I don't need to say that to that person because what you assume is obvious is probably potentially not obvious to the other person. So the more that you're explicit about what you want from somebody else, how much of what by when, the more likely you are creating a sense of fairness because people aren't psychic and they shouldn't have to guess. And um so that's that's one thing around the frustration I'm not getting what I want. The second one is <laughs> an interesting one. So a lack of true or deep connection has got worse because of covid. So these are the type of people who talk an awful lot in meetings. Really bubbly, fantastic to be around, and yet in a Zoom conversation completely dominate the space. And there are always quieter people who are perhaps more respectful or they like to wait till you finish speaking. <laughs> and if you never actually stop speaking, they actually see that as well, you know, everyone's just agreed with me. And and I think Andrew and I not mentioning any names have recently seen this in action 
<laughs> in training and in individual coaching. So if we look at it again from fairness, if you think you are somebody, and you know who you are, um, who is a little bit more chatty, it's, it's really to start balancing out your speaking and to actually listen twice as much as you speak and to ask good questions. Now, that's a really irritating one. When I used, when I heard that before, I understood, like, what's a good question? But ask yourself, am I asking a question I actually know the answer to, or I think I do know the answer to? Or am I actually really curious? I've got this question like, you know, what's important for you about this project? I have no idea what's important for the other person. So start asking questions that you really don't know the answer to, and then listen to what they have to say, really listen. So that would be something around connection while we're on Zoom and not in person and ever. I mean, even in person, it's a great thing to do. Um, yeah, another one is conflict avoidance. Again, this is, was absolutely there pre-COVID, got worse. Let's just wait until we all go back to the office. Mm. Have we lost Helen there? I think we've lost Helen slightly. Office. Oh, and back. Sorry, Helen, we lost you very momentarily, but I think you're back. Am I back? Yes. Managed. Okay. I hope so. So, I'm, okay, so the second one, uh, the other one is conflict avoidance. People didn't like conflict avoidance before or didn't like to com have conflict or before COVID. It has got worse and they've sort of waited. And I think if you again are looking at this from a sense of fairness, um, well, first of all, I think Effie mentioned this, but the idea is come from a position of everyone, believe everyone is doing their best with the tools and the knowledge and the current self-awareness they have. It might not be what you need or it might not you know, be sufficient, but if you come from the, an energy that I actually I do believe this person is doing their best. So then you're more curious about, well, how can we make it better? And it was, Effie mentioned that in the way that she was working with her team. And so you start having a conversation for curiosity. Uh, when it comes to conflict avoidance and having to actually address poor performance, I think it potentially says, it's a bit like feedback as well. It potentially says more about you and your not willingness to go into conflict. But ultimately, if you can look at, you're actually caring enough about this person to improve their performance, to better understand them. How can I get them? I have high expectations for them. And you're explicit, listen, I really believe in you. And there's this gap. So how can we, how can we shorten that gap? So uh, I would say, first of all, check your own relationship. Oh, Helen, we've seen to be losing Helen. Again, relationship to conflict. <laughs> We lost you slightly. Oh, totally gone. <laughs> and it was quite a key point because actually it's something Am that I back? you're back now. Yes. I was going to say it's, it's quite an interesting point as well, because it's something we get asked a lot where people don't want to deal with uh, conf not conflict, but maybe constructive criticism over Zoom. And as a result, maybe issues aren't tackled with straight away. Um, so That's I think right. you were just about to sort of tell us the best way perhaps to do that <laughs> so uh, yeah th just if i let me nutshell it so it's it's really to, to if you believe this it's really coming from a, a belief that this person can do more and we're looking at behavior not the person so drop your own be very curious about your own re resent um, resistance to having the conversation because it says more about you than the other person and actually come from a position of if i dare say this in a work context you love this person enough to invest some time to discuss how we're going to shorten the gap between where I believe you can go and where you currently are. It's about performance, not the personality. And again, listen, again, Effie said this, it's about really listening to the unmet needs of the other person. They will struggle to say, it. and your unmet need of efficiency, creativity, and perhaps your too keen on keep keeping the status quo and having calmness and stability, which is getting the way of you growing your team. 
Andrew, how do people do that over Zoom? I know um, uh, people have said that it's find it quite challenging, you know, and how do you feel those issues and also uh, deliver it in the right way? Because um, some, sometimes leaders struggle with that or managers. I'd say first off that what Helen and, and I think both spoken about is this, obviously, over the last 18 months, there's been a lot of group meetings on Zoom to bring people together. And just as Helen had said, you get people who talk too much and they dominate. And Zoom conversations with a big group of people don't really work very well, do they? Unless they're moderated. You need to have a sort of moderator in there. But I, I can't see there being too many challenges with having a one-to-one -one when you're giving some feedback to people. The, the big problem, I think, the big difficulty that people find is that in the pre, in, in, in the in-person world where we used to, you can make that ad hoc. You can say to them, oh, Helen, let's, I just wanted to have a quick chat about, da -da -da. let's just go and have a cup of coffee and make it informal. You set it up, you're in a nice surrounding. You go for a coffee, you talk about a problem. Um, and it's you've taken a lot of heat out of it and doing exactly what we you know we'd suggest managers train managers to do which is do it through questioning avoid the loaded questions ask open questions to get people to tell me about and then lead the questioning into getting them to do 80 percent of the talking this is not different online um, or in person it's just that i think it's more difficult to have those ad hoc um, things because you have to kind of make an appointment and send a zoom link and it's all a bit that's all a bit terrifying so i guess if as we're coming into a more hybrid world pick your moments where you do know that you're going to be with people if you want to have that informal not formal you know informal chat that's really important because i need to pick up something with you um, so there, yeah, there are challenges, but I, if you are having a formal session with somebody to give feedback, like a, a review meeting, I think that can be done just as well over the way, over online as in person. It's, but it's the more personable times that you that, that we do it around the coffee, you know, around coffee, for example, or in a in a room together. So I think it's pretty moments, and I think hopefully we're going to be afforded more in-person time with each other from now on. Good. Th thank you, Andrew. Um, I've got a few more key questions I'd love to ask the panel, but um, I do urge the audience to put some questions forward as well. I'm conscious of time and it's sort of quickly ticking away. Um, but uh, a key area that I would love to explore is around diversity. At Hanson Search, we're passionate about diversity in creating a more diverse, fair workforce. Um, Effie, I know you do a lot in the industry and comms around this topic. Could you tell us a bit about best practice, what you're seeing at the moment? Because um, I do think it's so fundamental to diversity of thinking and thought, um, especially in the communications industry. Yeah, absolutely. And um, as you mentioned, diversity for me is probably the thing that I'm most passionate about. You know, for me as a woman, as a black person, um, I just think it's really important that, and, and I think the thing that businesses hopefully are starting to understand is that when you have a diverse workforce, if you have lots of different ideas and lots of different people from various backgrounds, you're actually more productive as a business. If you have everyone that thinks the same, that's come from the same background that has the same ethnicity or gender you you tend to sort of sway towards the same type of thought and particularly for a business like ours which is creative um it's all about getting those different opinions and lived experiences that can bring different perspectives and if you think about a magazine business and magazine brands our readers, our customers, our consumers are varied and, you know, come in all shapes and sizes and genders and et cetera. And so having a, you know, a workforce that understands that, you know, enables you to produce better work. Um, and I think definitely what companies and brands have seen um, over the past 18 months is that people are starting to hold businesses to account. 
Um, and so it comes from the outside, from your clients, from your consumers, but also staff internally are asking more questions and are really sort of pushing for greater diversity. Um, I think there are some, some sort of great initiatives within uh, the industry. We just recently um, launched uh, an initiative on my team, which is basically to bring uh, comms professionals who maybe don't know a lot about luxury and publishing that come from underrepresented backgrounds and want to sort of have training and development. Um, we've offered this scheme to actually help them. So whether it's kind of entry level or more importantly, sort of in the sort of mid level, hoping to, to progress to senior management, because I do think that there are some industries that are less representative than others. Um, and to do that, that means that you, you need to do the work and there has to be change. I think the one thing I would say is, is that there is great work being done very much at an entry level. I think the focus, and you know, we're starting to see it. I know that um, Elizabeth uh, Bananuka and her exec scheme, um, I think we need to put the focus on getting people into boardrooms, right? Like mid-level mid managers, like entry-level grads, uh, I think I think we've kind of covered that off. I think it's investing in the talent that you already have, growing them. If you don't have them, looking in different spaces to attract the talent, because it's not that the talent isn't there. It's just that you're not reaching them or you're not looking for them. And I think it's putting the time and effort and investment into really growing people, because I think we really need to start seeing more diverse boardrooms. It's hugely important for every business. Um, and I think the last thing is, is that we need to also get away from diversity being something that we suddenly remember around Pride or around Black History Month. That's, that's not diversity. Diversity has to be ingrained into everything that you do and across every area of the business. So for us, it's across our sort of content um, and, you know, the type of content that we produce within our magazine brands. Does it cater, you know, for everyone, regardless of where they come from? But then also in terms of kind of who we work with, the representation within our commercial campaigns, etc. cetera. So um, I just think it's really important for businesses to make sure that that diversity thread goes through everything that they do as a business it's it's not just a, a sort of one thing that you tap into and then it's ticked and then it's job done I think everyone within a business if you're committing as a business to diversity I think the onus is on everyone within the business wanting to make it a better place to work for everyone but also to produce products or whatever it is that also um, ensures that you're catering to a wider audience. So, so those are really my thoughts. And, um, you know, I think companies and businesses have kind of been forced to consider it because if you're not considering it, then your consumers will tell you about it. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, from my, you know, I've been working, I've been working in this industry for 20 years now and, and headhunting and, the conversations are definitely so much more prominent. People are wanting to make a change and, and that's great to see. But I also know when, you know, hiring gets tough and um, people are desperate to find certain skills and people are feeling their team are overloaded, they just go for the quick fix. And so I, I think it's now making sure that it's not just the quick fix. It is continuing to do what you say you want to do and make those changes. And it's so important. Um, you know, the war on talent is heating up. Maybe this is a real opportunity to take talent from different areas and skill them up, you know, and, and put them in those leadership roles. So uh, ho hopefully there's a positive that can can come out of this as well. Um, just on the, on the topic of uh, that sort of, feeling burnt out people are working very very hard um and have worked hard especially in communications that was definitely the feedback we got from in-house teams and agencies there was a little bit of reluctance to hire last year 
now it's full steam ahead. Um, but people are feeling a little bit exhausted and perhaps treated unfairly. Um, how do now people and uh, businesses resolve that with teams? Um, Effie, I'm sure from what you've said, you know, your team is, is flowing brilliantly, but I'm sure you've heard broader stories in the industry. And maybe Helen and Andrew, you could uh, respond to that in terms of some, some best practice to ensure fairness um, when people sometimes be a little bit burnt out and overloaded. Effie, what have you seen any good practices in the industry? Sure. Um, I mean, I can, I and maybe sort of Helen and Andrew can um, talk broadly. I can talk about what I did on my team and what worked for us. Um, and it was small things, things like we would have tea breaks. So as opposed to always talking about work and and you know business and what we had to deal with next. Um, we would just have a cup of tea or a coffee and, you know, talk about what workout we've done. Like uh, one thing we, we all are actually lucky on my team is that we're massively into fitness. And I think fitness, mental health, you know, there's definitely a link there. And so I think it's really important that we've kind of been motivating um, each other to sort of take the time to, you know, take physical exercise. like. Every lunchtime, we do a check-in to make sure everyone's got out because otherwise you can find that eight hours has passed and you haven't left your screen. So every lunchtime, we check in and we make sure that everyone, you know, goes out. We have these tea breaks where we talk about our lives, what we've watched, what we've cooked, you know, where we're going, new restaurants we've discovered. That's really, really important. Um, and also one thing that I've really loved about, and I've done it myself, about my team is that, you know, there's, there's someone on my team who has a partner who lives in Germany and a family that lives in the US. And there was a sort of considerable amount of time where he hadn't seen them. And so what's been great is that he's been able to work from the US and flex his hours. And like, I'm a big believer, it's all about output. Um, you know, so as long as you're getting the job done, I couldn't care less where you're working from. Some people have been working from Spain. Um, I've been working from Germany. Um, so, so yeah, so it's, it's kind of just having that, I guess, this period has given us the opportunity to sort of try out new things and just come together with a sort of greater sense of um, camaraderie. And I think um, because it has been so challenging for everyone, I think those small things like making sure we have fun as a team, making sure that we're kind of more social, but it's not just about work, making sure that people can, you know, go and see family if they live abroad or just work from abroad if they want to. Those I think are the key things. Um, and I think for businesses, like in terms of retaining your workforce, I think if you do sort of introduce like measures that kind of um, take into account that the world has changed and that there needs to be that sort of greater degree of flexibility. Um, you know, hopefully it doesn't impact, you know, people actually thinking, and I, and I don't know if you've seen this, Alice, but um, I would definitely, if I was moving to another job, if there wasn't um, provisions for flexibility, it would make me think twice about taking a role because mm -hmm. I want to be within a business where the culture is there that will, you know, cater to my sort of various needs and will have a degree of flexibility. So I think if you want to attract great talent, I think as a manager, as a team, you need to start thinking about people are thinking more about getting a sort of a better sort of work and life balance that you don't all have to be in the office at the same time, that doesn't affect your productivity. So what can you do as a team to ensure that you're still delivering, because we're a business, you're still delivering, but people are still being able to enjoy and do the things that they want to do. Absolutely. So just some interesting stats from our, our study, only 3% of individuals want to go back to 
to an office full time, um, 30% of individuals who responded actually sought out jobs based purely based on flexibility. And um, flexibility now ranks higher than salary and benefits in terms of what individuals are looking for. It, it comes just under people and culture. And I would actually argue the flexibility, people and culture all sort of come in together, really. So um, if businesses aren't thinking about it, not responding to what's happening, then they, they could be in fear of losing some great individuals. Um, mm. Andrew, what's your thoughts? Just to, yes, just going on from what their favourite has been talked about, and I, and also what Helena mentioned in terms of uh, how this, I think, affects how we approach training of managers, middle managers, leaders, senior managers. There's a whole range of different behaviours that we can help people with, train people when they're talking to staff, um, from being accountable, uh, clarity in your communications, use of voice, all of those things. But I think there are three things that I think may come to the fore, um, which all relate to, are we checking in? And one thing is concern about welfare. So does my manager, so as a member of staff, does my manager actually check in on me and check that I've gone and had lunch and gone out of the room, you know, and, and, and taken a proper, proper break, or do they ignore that? Um, also, does my manager listen to me uh, or just make assumptions and start? you know, and give 80% of the conversation. So are they listening? And are they showing that they're listening to me? And I think the other communication skill for managers is, do they, does my manager give me a chance to speak? Um, or is it all loaded against me? So I think those are three elements in communications, in management communications, that I think may come uh, as, 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 you know, may be re-prioritised, um, which all goes to lead to people feeling I'm being treated fairly. Uh, absolutely. Helen, what's your thoughts? After everything everybody said, it's, um, it's pretty good. I mean, I love what Effie was saying and I've heard similar things. So these little things that make such a difference. Um, Effie's talking about exercise. I have another colleague and they put in a, a whole taking photographs competition. Um, get outside so they had to be taken outside and they had a different theme each day so it was a, a proof that people were getting outside and uh, either black and white or it'd be something crazy that they'd seen the other one was stuff again really simple beat the boss in steps so they had a weak competition and everyone was trying to do more steps than the boss so and it's silly stuff like that that say, I say silly it's not silly at all it it's just does so many things it makes people laugh it, it gives permission to leave their desk and because there's this guilt around, I've got so much to do. And so if your boss is encouraging it and is egging you on and other people are sort of getting out there, it's absolutely gives you permission to go do it too. I mean, I'm guilty as the rest. You know, I find myself sitting at my desk and <laughs> having to kind of wean myself off it and, and crawl out of the office. So, um, and, and something that I... I think it's, it is for everybody to do. And I would say it's for the leader to be vulnerable first. And so when the leader starts to admit that they're struggling or that they've had situation that they've had to overcome, it just bursts the balloon and gives other people permission to also express what they're going through. So it's, it's, I'm going to quote a Brené Brown quote, which is, vulnerability is the last thing we want people to see in us and the first thing we want to see in other people and this would be talking about trust and to be heard but that's one of the fastest ways of building connection and creating that sense of permission and fairness that we can we can actually express that things aren't going so well for us at home Great. Thank you for that. I've got a few questions coming in. So I'm going to jump to some questions. Um, we've only got sort of six minutes left. So do ask any more questions to the, to the panel if you have them. Um, one is around uh, Nike's decision to uh, close down uh, for a whole week, close the business down um, to let their staff recharge. Do you think, though, this puts pressure on a business that can't afford to press the pause button? So with all these sort of new things out there, you know, saying, actually, everyone, let's have a week off. Do you think this is putting external pressure on other types of businesses that can't afford to do this? 
so I, I can answer from a Hearst perspective. So actually in the States, they did that. So, uh, but they kind of split the business into two because if you think about us as a business, we've got magazines to produce and content to produce. So you can't have everyone off at the same time. So what they actually did was they, um, they split the business in two. So it's almost like a shift pattern that one week, you know, one half of the business took off and then the other um, week, the other half of the business uh, took off. Within the UK, the way that we did it was that we took every Friday off for the, for the month of August. And actually in the UK, we preferred that because it just meant shorter working weeks. It meant like longer weekends. So that worked really well for us. So I think, you know, you kind of have to evaluate um, as a business, like, you still have to keep the wheels turning. So how can you best do that? How can you best adapt that? But honestly, the, the, you know, the feedback from everyone, it was just at the right time. It's just what everyone needed. You know, the weather hasn't been great. So I can't say like, it's like we could enjoy more of the lovely weather, but it was just, you know, it was the, the thought that our business was actually understanding how hard we'd worked this entire year and actually giving us what I think is the most precious thing of all, which is time. That's lovely, it's a great idea. Um, another question has come in around um, uh, creating environments where people can fail. Often people are at, um, at home and uh, there's a great motto though, that it's fine to fail. And you know, in the US people are pushed to fail, but people feel a little bit more reluctant to fail. How do, how do people sort of foster that confidence um, in individuals and teams when working, when they aren't together and they're working from home? Helen, can I ask that, that question failure. to yourself? Yeah, and creating yeah. confident teams when they're working, um, when they aren't together. Yeah, well, I mean, it isn't always fine to fail. I mean, fail, failing has to be within a context, all right? Because failing, uh, and you know, Andrew and I live in a in a part of the world where failure is a, you know absolutely frowned upon. Um, so, failure, I think, is well. First of all, I think it needs to come from leadership that there is. Uh, we are what Effie's been talking about. We are pushing the boundaries. We're exploring we're we're a diverse team and we want to be more creative and i so you've you've already got that understanding that we know that there will be an element where we're taking a bit of a risk i don't think failure should be a shock to anyone so that means that as a manager you're or as a leader you're very close to your team it should be an ongoing discussion and that you can make decisions as you go along so if suddenly there's this failure then i would look at myself as a manager going, wow, what have I created that no one's telling me? So I don't think failure should be a surprise. Um, and yeah, I think the failure, you need to be learning from it. So there needs to be a culture. I think Effie also mentioned this, or was it Andrew, around, you know, that feedback. So this is what we've learned. So you don't end up having other people doing the same thing. But what is it? So this is what we take away. This is what we have actually, this is the feedback we're getting from our market or from our customers. And so you, you, that's gotta be fed along that we could look at it as a failure, but actually it was really interesting because what we learned was this, and this is how we're gonna change the business. Okay, right, thank Those you. Are a few things. Yes, there's another question that's come in about, um, as I mentioned before, about uh, being vulnerable and um, looking after employee wellbeing, but how to manage how do you manage team members who aren't comfortable sharing how they're feeling or the challenges they're facing in their personal life? Okay. Andrew, do you want to take that one? Yeah, I would say um, that's one of these three areas we were talking about, uh, showing concern, listening, and giving a chance to speak. Very much developing your listening skills and, and, and uh, checking and, and making sure as a manager or a co-worker that you're also uh, picking up if they don't want to tell you certain things, it's private. Um, I don't want to. I don't want to, have to share with you. Um, so let it be. Um, or will the conversation, if it becomes you know longer, will they will they open up and say, well, 
these are things that are happening. So I, I think that's a that's an analytical skill, not just an analytical skill, but it's a perception skill, and that, that's obviously a communication skill, which is learning to listen, learning to um, to, to to understand the uh, what you're hearing, and obviously not to intrude when somebody says no, that's my private space. I'd, I'd rather not say. Thank you. One final question, because I'm conscious of time, but I think it's a it's a nice one to end on. How to best motivate people exhausted by crisis communications as a result of the pandemic and inspire them about the post pandemic vision and future. So it's quite nice to think about the future as we end this, but uh, uh, maybe a top tip from from each of our panelists um, on how to inspire them about uh, about the future vision post pandemic. Effie, Anyone? I think I just want to hear Effie because she's been she's been doing crisis communication. I think she can tell us. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, <laughs> that's a really good question. I mean, uh, I I don't think there is a single person that uh, you know can say that the sort of crisis comes over the past year or so has been pleasant. But um, I think for us as a team where we are at now as opposed to when we were in the thick of it is that we all feel as though we've grown as individuals and so like the feedback from my team is they want to do more courses around crisis comms and you know just learn more and um definitely one of the things that really helped and we were talking about failure was that as opposed to me sort of stepping in every time and and solving a particular issue I think it was really important for the team to work through the issues themselves and to have their own opinions and to think through their approach of how you know how they would deal with a certain situation and if it was right great and if it wasn't right then I could then step in and give them feedback well have you considered this and blah 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 um I think sort of moving forward in terms of sort of motivation, I think it's taking stock of what you have achieved. And when I look back at what we've achieved, it's kind of remembering when I was talking about the small wins and the big wins, it's constantly reminding yourself of what you have achieved and just how far we've, you know, we've come as a team. Um, and I use a lot of data and measurement. I set KPIs across our corporate internal consumer, actually using that to show the progress that you've kind of made and then celebrating it. I mean, it, it's as simple as that. Great, thank you. Andrew, have you got anything to add to that? Um, all I would say is that the style and tone of the communications when it's crisis is one thing. It's, it's a short, sharp directive we've got to get from chaos to order quickly. Um, so let's do it, let's just get it done. Um, and let's be sort of definitive about it. Vision communications are completely different. It's a completely different language, different tone. It's, it's all about us and we and what we believe and where we're going. It's just a different tone, different language. So I think you, you have to shift gears. Um, that's all I'd say about it. It's, Great. Yeah. Thank you. And Helen, last point on that. Just to bring it in, what I'm hearing both of you saying is that, you know, Effie's team has grown and they want more. And Andrew's talking about vision. And so Effie could absolutely create this context of what do we want to create next, as opposed to telling this is what we're going to create next. She's got a team now that can really give her a huge amount of ideas and creativity to create that vision together. And I mean, that's the ultimate way is to get buy-in from everybody. It's that they own it. Brilliant. Well, I'm already getting emails that are popping up on my laptop to say thank you very much indeed um, for this discussion this morning. Um, I really, really enjoyed it. This is the oh, first right. part of a three-part series. So um, we will be emailing everyone uh, to sign up to the, the next two parts. Um, Effie, Andrew, Helen, thank you so much indeed. I've got pages of notes that I've been scribbling away <laughs> <laughs> that I'll be putting into good use, hopefully. But listening, celebrating success all seem to come out of that. And uh, I hope the audience um, enjoyed this morning as well. Thank you so much indeed. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.